So no, when when Napoleon escapes from Elba and comes back in 1815 uh, to serve uh, a second time as leader of France, um, this is going to be known as the Hundred Days, his last bid for power, because he's only in uh, power for 100 days. And ultimately, Napoleon will be uh, defeated uh, once and for all uh, by the British and by the Prussians in June of 1815 at the Battle of Waterloo. Um, <clears throat> After the Battle of Waterloo and Napoleon and the French forces are defeated, uh, the British will take no more chances, and they actually ship Napoleon off uh, to a small island in the South Atlantic right off the uh, west coast of Africa uh, called, called St. Helena. And uh, we'll, we'll look at St. Helena if you want to. I can show you where that is on a map. It's a very small dot um, in the South Atlantic, uh, you know, right there in between um, South America and the west coast of Africa. Um, so he's going to be exiled there, and six years later, he's actually going to die um, of, they think, stomach cancer. And so afterwards, uh, when Napoleon is uh, defeated, uh, there will be something called the uh, Congress of Vienna. Uh, the Congress of Vienna is when these European heads of government uh, are looking to establish a long pass in peace and stability on the continent after the defeat of Napoleon, something they haven't had. And they had a goal of the new European order, one of collective security. Uh, that means that everybody's kind of looking out for each other. Uh, collective security, this will actually... Uh, uh, it come up in what's called the uh, the concert of Europe, where you see that these uh, these nations uh, would help each other out if any rev revolutions broke out again. And so you want to have this collective security and stability on the continent. Uh, the Congress of Vienna was set up, uh, you know, or was a series of meetings uh, to set up policies to meet this goal of a collective uh, uh, Europe working together to ensure stability and long-lasting peace. Uh, the man that's going to be in charge of the C Congress of Vienna uh, was the foreign minister of Austria, a man named Clemens von Metternich. And Clemens von Metternich had three points uh, to uh, ensure that this Congress of Vienna was going to be a success. All right, so his first plan is that he wanted to prevent further French aggression. And so he's going to do this by uh, by surrounding France with stronger countries. Uh, second, he wants to restore a balance of power. Uh, so no country could be seen as a threat uh, to others. And then third, he wanted to reestablish Europe's royal families uh, to the thrones that had held the throne uh, before Napoleon's conquest. Um, and so the Congress is going to, is going to take uh, the, uh, some steps here to make the weaker countries around France stronger. Uh, number one, the former Austrian, Netherlands, and Dutch Republic were united to form the Kingdom of the Netherlands. A group of 39 German states were loosely joined as a newly created German Confederation. Switzerland was recognized as an independent nation, and the Kingdom of Sardinia uh, in Italy was strengthened by the uh, addition of Genoa. And so these changes enabled uh, the countries of Europe to contain France and to prevent it from overpowering weaker countries. And so the second point here of uh, Metternich's plan for Europe was this balance of power. Uh, they wanted to make sure that if... Um, they wanted to make sure that even if they weaken France, they wouldn't weaken it so much that another country uh, could become so strong and threaten them all. Remember, uh, the Congress of Vienna wants to ensure peace and stability for the entire continent. And so that way you cannot have uh, these really, really weak countries, but you can't have these really, really strong countries. And so as a result, you see that France, after the Congress of Vienna, will re remain a major but a diminished power in Europe. And also in Europe, uh, with this balance of power, no country could easily overpower another. And so the third point here, restoring these uh, former monarchs that had been removed from the throne, um, Prior, uh, during Napoleon's invasions and conquests. Um, these great powers by, uh, by restoring these old monarchs and these old royal families, it affirmed the principle of legitimacy. Um, you know, they, they agree into the fact that, you know, we need to put as many power, uh, rulers, uh, uh, of whom Napoleon had driven from their thrones, uh, back to power. And so a lot of these ruling families in, uh, in Europe, like the fa ruling, uh, royal families in France, Spain, uh, Italy, uh, Central Europe, they g regained their throne. So this is a triumph, um, for conservatives or for people that, uh, you know, were, were, um, were, were more, 
were more, uh, I guess you could say, uh, willing to accept uh, constitutional monarchies, uh, limited monarchies. Um, but in general, you know, generally speaking, uh, the restoration of these former ruling families in these European countries uh, was definitely, um, you know, sense uh, gave the, these countries a sense of legitimacy. Um, and it was definitely, uh, you know, a step, uh, you know, back to this more conservative element. Um, the Congress of Vienna was uh, considered a major triumph in uh, in a couple of different ways. Number one, uh, for the first time, the nations of an entire continent had co uh, had cooperated to control political affairs. Uh, the settlements they agreed upon uh, were fair enough so that no country uh, was left, you know, uh, wanting to settle a grudge. And so, therefore, the Congress of Vienna didn't sow the seeds uh, for future wars. And so, in that sense, it was more successful than any of the peace meetings in history. Um, also, by uh, by creating this balance of power um, among the countries in Europe, uh, the Congress of Vienna is then going to create a, a time of peace in Europe. It was a lasting peace uh, where none of the five great powers waged war, uh, you know, for uh, on each other for for uh, around 40 years, uh, which, you know, in to us might not seem uh, like a long time, but if you look back on the history of Europe, uh, they've been engulfed in uh, in a series of wars and battles with each other uh, for you know the past 300 to 400 years. So uh, to have this period of peace now as a result of uh, the Congress of Vienna was a major victory. Um, and so what was a long-term legacy of the Congress of Vienna? Uh, the legacy of the Congress of Vienna is that is going to, uh, you know, um, maintain that balance of power um, and at the same time uh, the legacy of the Congress of Vienna by maintaining this balance of power is going to diminish the role of the French but it's also going to increase the power of the British and the Prussians. Uh, remember the Prussians are uh, are going to eventually um, consolidate these German states and become known as Germany. And so what's the legacy of the uh, Congress of Vienna? You see France uh, you know, take a step back as far as being the major power in Europe and you see England and Germany for all intents of purposes take a major step forward um, as far as being the, uh, the, the the major powers in Europe. Uh, the second uh, legacy that Napoleon, uh, that the Congress of Vienna is going to leave behind is a legacy of nationalism. Uh, nationalism, this pride in one's culture, ethnicity, uh, pride in or loyalty to, to one's country is going to start to spread in uh, places like Italy, uh, Germany, and Greece. And these nationalistic feelings are going to uh, explode into revolutions and these new nations are going to be formed um, in, in response to this, uh, to this, uh, to this growing sense of, of pride and, and this, this sense of loyalty that people that share the same culture as you or share the same ethnicity as you. And you will see, uh, you know, countries formed out of this, uh, this sense of nationalism, like Germany, for instance, is going to be formed, uh, from these nationalistic revolutions. Italy is going to be another one, uh, that is formed out of these nationalistic revolutions. Um, and you also start to see, uh, some of these Spanish colonies and see other colonies uh, you know uh, that were that belong to the European countries they're going to take advantage of this power shift and they're going to start to attempt to break away uh, from their colonial uh, powers and so a lot of these Spanish colonies in Latin America and in South America are going to stage their own revolutions and attempt to break away from the colonial uh, ties of, a, of say a Spain uh, for instance, which will uh, see their uh, empire diminish greatly as a series of these, uh, as a result of these revolutions that start to happen uh, in Latin America and South America, um, you know, led by Simon Bolivar, um, as a result of this uh, this growing sense of nationalism, uh, which the Congress of Vienna left behind. Um, so I hope that, you know, after viewing this playlist of uh, videos on the French Revolution, that you can understand or that you understand and you can explain to me um, the, the old regime. Uh, you can ex explain to me the causes of the French Revolution. You can explain to me the changes that the French Revolution um, brought to France and also the terror that the French Revolution brought to France. Uh, I hope, hopefully you can explain to me uh, that how uh, this growing, uh, uh, this grow, this, this long uh, period of violence uh, in France is going to lead the French people to desire a, a strong leader who can give them uh, peace and stability again, which will allow somebody like 
and Napoleon uh, to come to power. Um, I hope that you can explain to me um, how Napoleon um, was able to take the ideas of the revolution and put them into place with some of his policies towards the French government and the French people. Uh, I hope you can explain to me um, where Napoleon succeeded in uh, gaining land in uh, mostly pretty much all of Europe except for Britain. Um, Hopefully you can explain to me um, how where Napoleon lost land um, in the Americas. Um, hopefully you can explain to me how Napoleon ultimately, uh, you know, was defeated by making those three costly mistakes, the Continental System, the Peninsula War with the Spanish guerrillas, and the invasion of Russia and the scorched earth policy. And then last but not least, um, what happens to Europe? Uh, as a result of the defeat of Napoleon in 1815 at the Battle of Waterloo, uh, the Congress of Vienna set up by Clemens von Metternich and uh, his three points of um, making sure that uh, there's a balance of power, uh, restoring the old monarchs that were taken out as a result of Napoleon's conquest, and put in, uh, and put in France uh, on the back burner, uh, you know, as far as being a great power by strengthening the countries uh, around them. Um, if you can do this, you have a very good grasp on chapter 23. If you cannot do any of these things, I su suggest that you uh, spend time um, outside of class um, looking at maybe creating some main ideologues, looking at my Cornell notes, asking me questions, um, looking at uh, the chapter assessment, uh, you know, in the, and at the end of the chapter, uh, chapter assessment questions at the end of the chapter. Um, making flashcards, doing anything that you can uh, to ensure that you have definitely mastered this content. Uh, looking at the the, uh, the documents that I've set up, looking at the additional readings that I've offered. Um, once again, though, the biggest thing is that if I still have not been clear on anything, uh, that you need to uh, take time to ask me questions so that you can make sure that you and I are on the same page and that you're on, the, uh, on a path to success in my class. Uh, thanks for watching, and I hope you have a great rest of your day or evening.